I can. Um, let's see. I first became aware of the letterpress revival back in 1981, long before I became a full-time type designer. I used to design and art direct magazines and other publications. Back then, I was working for Minnesota Monthly, a regional magazine that was published by Minnesota Public Radio. In addition to the classical music schedule and things like that, they printed articles about culture and the arts. One time they did an article about a guy named Gerald Lang. Some of you here may have heard of Jerry or even maybe even know him. Back then he had a small letterpress shop called the Beeler Press. I was on the, it was on the sixth floor of the old Rossmore building in downtown St. Paul at the time. I went there one day with a photographer to take pictures for the article and was immediately blown away by his studio. Along with all the tools of fine letterpress printing and uh, like a Vandercook proofing press, uh, one or two platen presses, um, shelves full of inks and solvents, cases of old foundry type, and freshly cast bembo and polyphilus type that he got from somebody who had a uh, monotype caster or something like that, I think he told me. He had a huge library of books all about printing and type and printing. It was, a, it was the first time I'd seen a lot of them, including the old American Type Founders catalogs and Linotype catalogs. Jerry's work was amazing. I was really impressed by the craft and attention to detail. He invited me to come by any time I wanted, so I ended up spending my lunch breaks over the next few weeks hanging out in Jerry's shop, talking with, with him about presses, paper, printing, and especially about type. He was a big proponent of the classic old style faces like Bembo and Garmond and didn't think much of modern typography or type design. It started having a funny effect on my design work at the magazine. Right around that time we were doing a redesign and naively I thought I could emulate some of the aesthetic of Jerry's letterpress typography. So I ordered some Garmond fonts for our copygraphic typesetting machine and bought some sheets of Garamond old style rub down type. After a little while though I realized that I wasn't really getting quite the same effect. Phototype set Garamond on offset printing on thin bright white glossy paper doesn't look or feel anything like metal foundry type printed on a Vandercook on handmade paper. It was a different medium with a different visual vocabulary. Things that worked with one didn't necessarily work for the other. The type looked anemic and fussy instead of rich and warm, which was what I was after. I eventually abandoned that idea and embraced a more appropriate aesthetic. I was thinking about all this recently, about the renaissance of letterpress and why, in spite of my early exposure to the beautiful work Jerry was doing at the Beeler Press, I've never fully embraced letterpress as a hobby or an aesthetic or anything like that, like many of my friends and colleagues have done. I, and I truly admire what people are doing with it, and I think it's great that so many people are into it right now. But it's just never really been my thing, and I realize why. Basically, that offset lithography has its own aesthetic, and I've always felt at home with it, that it's basically my native medium. And I don't really mean the traditional lithography, like with a stone, like shown here, uh, although the basic principle is the same. Now with letterpress, you want, the image you want to print is formed on a raised surface such as metal type or woodcut. And the ink is applied to the raised surface and transferred to the paper on the press. With stone lithography, you print from a big, flat, polished stone slab. And the image you want to print is formed with a grease pencil or brushed on with touche. The stone is wetted, the ink sticks to the greasy parts, and that's what you print from. Lithographic prints compared to letterpress prints are flat and uniform. They don't have the same kind of texture, but are capable of, capable of richer detail and more subtle of variation. Historically, lithography was used for printing things like certificates, color illustrations in books, posters, art prints, things that letterpress were less well suited for. But what I'm really talking about here is uh, offset lithography. It works on the same principle as stone lithography, but instead of using a big, heavy stone, 
It uses thin aluminum plates wrapped around cylinders. The ink is transferred, that is offset, hence the name, uh, to a rubber roller and then onto the paper. It was faster and cheaper than stone lithography and had, but had most of the same advantages in terms of image reproduction. The other big difference is that the image on the plate is transformed photographically. Artwork shot is shot with high contrast film creating a negative which is then used to burn a positive image onto a plate with an intensely bright carbon arc lamp. The photographic aspect is one of the key differences between offset and letterpress. Although you can create relief plates photographically, the results tend to be a bit more crude, especially for things like photos. Another key difference is that type is no different than any other image that you might want to print. The adoption of offset actually is what made possible phototype, strike on type, rub down type, and ultimately digital type. When I was a kid back in the 60s, uh, I went on a grade school field trip one time to a newspaper publisher in Milwaukee. I vividly recall seeing these giant cylindrical presses and watching plates being made with paper stereotypes and an operator at a linotype machine banging out slugs of type. As a souvenir, I got these little miniature copies of the newspapers that they published there. The local newspaper in my hometown of Bloit, Wisconsin also used letterpress. This is actually a photo of me that appeared in the paper when I was 10 years old. You can see how crude the reproduction was. But back then, poor photo reproduction was just normal, you know. Uh, it was like black and white TV, monaural sound, and rotary dials on phones. We didn't know any better. That was just the way things were. But I do remember when, they, when the paper made the switch to offset printing in the late 60s. I didn't really know what offset meant, but it was hailed as an improvement and a big, a big selling point was better photo reproduction. And it really was noticeably better. I didn't know much about any of this stuff back then. I was just a little kid. But my impression was that letterpress was old and lousy and, on, and obsolete and that offset was new and better, the way of the future. I had my first uh, first-hand taste of the wonders of offset printing when I was in eighth grade. I designed and illustrated the cover of the yearbook that year. I drew a picture, did some lettering, and laid out the design. I was a bit annoyed that the printer replaced some of my lettering with a typeface, and the illustration was actually supposed to bleed off the bottom and side. But I was, it was really exciting to see hundreds of pristine copies of something I designed. Still, the whole production process was kind of a mystery. I had only a, the vaguest idea of how they went from my construction paper layout to the finished printed piece. A few years later, I was a junior in high school. The school newspaper, called the Trojan, had a problem. It was in the middle of the school year, and the staff had basically quit. Uh, nobody was really interested in doing it anymore. This gave me an idea. I talked to the newspaper advisor, advisor and asked him if I could be the editor of the paper. Now, Trojan was your typical high school newspaper, stories about student council, sports teams, opinion pieces about dress code and vending machines, things like that. I had no interest in any of that. I wanted to do something a little different with the help of some of my friends. Now, back then I'd been reading Mad Magazine since I was 10 years old and had recently discovered the National Lampoon. I loved that funny, smart-ass stuff and wanted to try to do something like that myself. So my idea was to transform the Trojan into a humor paper. Amazingly, the advisor agreed to let me do it, at least for an issue. I also had a, uh, was becoming aware of type and graphic design at the time. I had an uncle, uh, my uncle Knut, who was a young graphic designer in Chicago. He worked at Container Corporation for a while and then at a small studio called Dickinson Design. While he was there, he worked on the design of the original Tab soft drink can and some of the early Keebler cookie packages. I was an artistic kid. I drew all the time and even took oil painting classes for a few years. And I knew I wanted to go into some kind of art career when I grew up. And graphic design seemed like a good possibility. As far as getting something on, like a newspaper printed, I knew that you had to do a paste up first. I had no idea, I mean I had no graphic arts training at that point, but it didn't seem that different than the collages I had done back in third grade. 
It was a lot of fun combining photos and images in crazy and, crazy and surprising ways. And paste-up seemed like a pretty similar process. So I started out with a blank layout sheet, pre-ruled with light blue guidelines. I knew the basic rules. You only could use black and white, and black reproduces black, and also, so did red, so you could use red if you needed to cover large area or something like that. And then light blue with, uh, was the same as white, it didn't print. So you could make notes with a blue pencil and draw guidelines on your paste up. I realized that anything, it kind of it dawned on me that anything I could put down on paper could be printed as long as it followed these simple rules. My mind reeled with possibilities. So I went home and sat down in the living room after school one night and started building it up little by little, writing as I went. I clipped things out of magazines and newspapers, did some lettering, drew some stuff, clipped stuff out of phone books and calendars, set type with this weird cardboard headline setting system that they had at the publications office. I'll talk a little more about this later. Uh, used a typewriter to set the body type, and little by little, over the next several days, I'd written and designed the entire first page. After a week or so, I had four pages ready to print, which was how long the paper was. I dropped it off at a job printer located in a small, low commercial building along a stretch of dry cleaning shops, uh, auto parts stores, and beauty parlors. The place was filled with the chunka chunka sounds of small offset presses working away. A few days later, I went back to the print shop and stacked on a table was the first run of my new paper. It smelled of fresh ink and was cool to the touch from evaporating alcohol. Every little detail was perfectly reproduced with no evidence of my messy paste up. It felt like magic. This was the moment that I fell in love with offset. I loaded the stack in my car and headed back to school. I had no idea what the other students would make of it. Only a few of them knew about it. I worried that it would be seen as a big waste of school resources, or that nobody would get the jokes. But somehow it worked, and people liked it. And amazingly, I was allowed to keep doing it. I continued to experiment as we did a couple more issues that year. It all felt like a big adventure, trying different ideas, seeing what would work and what didn't. And all, all the while, entertaining ourselves, and, and we hoped our fellow students. I happened to be editor of the yearbook that year as well, although it took that a little bit more seriously. And a lot of the same kids who helped me with the paper also worked on that. We were routinely able to get passes out of study hall to spend time working on the paper and the yearbook. The publication office became kind of a hangout for me and my friends. We covered the place with signs and random pages cut out of magazines for some reason. Uh, these photos on the left, for instance, were altered so that the eyes followed you down the hall as you walked past. There's Bob Hope again. Uh, <coughs> looking at the place, you'd think that we spent all our time making silly decorations, which wasn't totally untrue. But uh, you know how people like to practice their free throw shot with a trash can? We took that a step further. Uh, you might be surprised that we actually got any work done there at all, but we did. The second issue of the Trojan uh, was promoted as lemon scented. It was printed on yellow paper and each issue included a stick of lemon flavored gum. For those too young to remember, every brand of floor wax back then, or dishwashing detergent or furniture polish was being advertised as lemon scented, so why not hop onto the bandwagon? Uh, doing this newspaper was my first real experience with working with type and design. The yearbook didn't really count because you only got to, you didn't get to do actual paste ups and production and stuff like that. I learned to like use a uh, proportion wheel and, and a cropping tool, but no paste up or anything. I had no formal training yet, and I was just figuring out things as I went along, using whatever I had on hand to make it work. I was really interested in the content, hoping to make it funny. But as a visually oriented, visually oriented person, I was just as interested in trying to make it look funny, too. Um, first, I decided that the name of the paper would never be spelled correctly or consistently. Why? I don't know. It just seemed funny that way. 
<laughs> it became almost, uh, almost like a nonsense word. I spent a lot of time figuring out different ways to spell it. Second, I claimed that each issue was five pages long. <clears throat> this is a physical impossibility, I'm sure you all realize, who have like press experience. Um, I got around that by accidentally skipping a page. So the pages would be numbered one, three, four, five, or one, two, four, five. Just to keep confuse things more, I sometimes put page one on the back cover. Uh, but the content was completely made up. Student council reports, letters to the editor, sports articles, and ads, lots of ads. Uh, it was really fun one time when I did uh, some comics, and I basically clipped bits and pieces of the comics from the Blake Daily News and reassembled them into complete nonsense. Uh, it's prob it was probably totally illegal, but I think this is what they call nowadays uh, remixing, so maybe it's okay. Um, I was also excited to, to discover several big clip art books at the publication office. Nowadays, uh, clip art was all, is all digital, but back then, it came in oversized books. They were like this tall. Uh, and you actually clip the art from the books with scissors or an X-Acto knife. Clip art would become a rich source of inspiration and mischief. It's okay if you can't read this tiny type there. The, the kids back then couldn't either. Uh, the publication office also had on hand something called phototype, spelled with an F, which was a kind of paper-based headline setting system. It worked a lot like metal foundry type, except it was made of cardboard. It even used a composing stick. The way it worked is you would tear off the letters you wanted from little pre-printed pads, and then you assembled them in a comp composing stick, letter by letter, just like metal type. And you notice they have the uh, letters printed on the back in non-repro repro blue. That's kind of a tongue twister. Uh, so you could see what you were doing. When you were done, when the line was finished, you put a piece of tape across the back and it was ready for paste-up. The selection of uh, phototype fonts that they had was pretty limited. Just a few styles and sizes of Futura and alternate Gothic. So I ordered some new stuff, including Universe, which I thought was more modern and attractive. And it was the closest thing to Helvetica that they had. Now, you might wonder, I'm 17 years old and I'm already worrying about using Helvetica, but I had an, this uncle who was a graphic designer. And, uh, and so, of course, I knew, knew about Helvetica. But as you can see, I still had some things to learn about setting type, not to mention using a straight edge or a T-square. I, I also discovered uh, press type sheets at the local stationery store, probably the cheapest rub down type ever made, and started setting display type with Caslon and Old English and Futura. You might also wonder why everything is set so goddamn tight. It's, it's not just touching, it's actually overlapping. Um, this is because my, of my uncle, the graphic designer again. That's how he said everything, and I picked up on that and copied him because obviously that's the way the pros were doing it, and plus I thought it looked cool. Later, I went to a big art supply store south of the border in Rockford, Illinois, and got some better quality rubdown tape. Uh, Letraset was the deluxe brand, and there was also the somewhat cheaper chart pack velvet touch lettering. <laughs> Eventually, I had sheets of big 96 point Helvetica medium some Bookman Swash, Windsor, Times Bold, and the amazing avant-garde gothic with alternate characters. For body type, my choices were more limited. I didn't have access to anything like a real typesetting machine for that, so I had to make do with typewriters. At first, I used my mom's portable typewriter at home. It worked okay, but it had a cloth ribbon, so it didn't really reproduce very well. Luckily, they had an IBM Selectric in the publication office. The Selectric was a, an, an electromechanical marvel. I don't know if you've ever seen one operating, but it had, had a little type ball in the middle that would pound out letters lightning fast onto the page, and the keys were like on hair triggers, and the machine would just kind of hum with anticipation when it was on. It also had a special carbon film ribbon, uh, so the letters were super sharp. 
We just loved it. In fact, uh, one of my friends and I invented a stupid little game on it that was a bit like Pong, uh, except that Pong hadn't been invented yet, so I guess it was actually more like tennis. But <laughs> player, one, player one hit the tab key, sending the type ball flying to the right. And player two hit the return key, sending the type ball flying to the left. The idea was to try to get the type ball to the opposite of the end of the typewriter and not let the type ball get to your end of the typewriter. It was fun until somebody figured out that holding down the tab key prevented the ball from traveling to the left at all, which was about five minutes after we invented the game. <laughs> uh, photos were a little tricky. Uh, you had to leave red paper holes on the paste up and calculate the percent reduction and enlargement of the photo. The printer would somehow apply a dot screen to the photo when it was printed. How this was done was a, kind of a mystery to me at the time. But I discovered that if something already had a screen, like a photo from a magazine or a book, I could just paste it up and it would print. It was a little dark, but it worked. Um, the school year ended, and over the summer I did a special issue, most of it on my own. This is the summer of the Watergate hearings, which seemed to dominate the media seven days a week, hence the headline here. I didn't have access to the Selectric, so and I'd already decided that my mom's typewriter wasn't good enough, so I decided to letter the whole issue by hand. Um, I did the lettering on graph paper and then cut it up and pasted the pieces in the, into place on the layout. I also hand lettered the headlines instead of using the phototype or rub, rub down type. When it was done, I had a six page issue, sorry, seven page issue, <laughs> to hand out to my fellow students that fall. Unfortunately, I was informed by the newspaper advisor, that guy, that some of the students and parents felt that the school paper should be a proper school paper. Uh, but rather than pull the plug on my little enterprise, the paper was split into two parts. The first part was the straight issue, <laughs> staffed by students who wanted to do a normal school paper with basketball and football scores, student council reports, debates over vending machines and dress codes. And this would be printed on the first two pages. My only involvement in this was designing the logo. There's that Helvetica again. Uh, and doing an occasional illustration. The other two pages would be done by me and my friends with our usual nonsense. Of course, I, I managed to get five pages out of it by, by turning it sideways and using smaller pages and with a little creative misnumbering. I changed the design when, I, when we went to this new format and settled on a consistent logo in a single wrong way to spell Trojan. You, you just get tired of trying to come up with new ways after a while. You can see a bit of the National Lampoon influence here, if any of you remember that magazine, with the issue themes like scary issue, apathy issue, and so on. I also did some comics usually featuring, featuring teachers as heroes in absurd storylines that seem to go nowhere. In this one here, the, 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 uh, this teacher who we called Smokey the Pole, uh, he, all he does is walk down the hall and walk into a restroom and then he never returns, you know. <laughs> and uh, the, that big 1974 on the right was actually I actually lettered that. I got some smaller rub, size rub down type, uh, set it on a piece of clear plastic, and then put it in a photo enlarger and traced it with markers. I didn't have a stat camera or anything like that. So it was, it was all very direct. <clears throat> For the last issue, I completely changed the format again, returning to full tabloid sized pages. Only two pages this time, numbered one through five. As you can see, I made heavy use of avant-garde rub-down letters for this issue. I used every possible ligature. The graphic in the middle is a reference to the whole Earth, last Whole Earth catalog, which had just been published. And as we, we also included a stick of gum with this issue again, orange, to go with a photo in the middle. Now, all of this served me well when, as I went on to study graphic design in college. And I even did some actual offset printing in a printmaking class. 
Starting from a paste up, I learned to make and strip photos or strip negatives. I learned to make plates with a carbon arc lamp and vacuum frame, and to do multicolored printing on a, on a small AB Dick press, similar to the one in this photo. Everybody loved to do split fountains. After college, one of my first jobs was as production manager at a weekly newspaper in Minneapolis called Metropolis. The budget was very small, but we had an actual typesetting machine and someone to operate who was actually the only one who went home at 5 o'clock because he was over 30. In a lot of ways, I, I felt like I, I was working on my high school newspaper again, especially in terms of figuring out how to take an idea and turn it into something that could be printed. The art director was a guy named Patrick J.B. Flynn, who later on was art director of the Progressive magazine for many years. Although I was technically, technically the production manager, we both worked on the design and the typography. We had three colors to work with, black, black and two Pantone colors, and we'd try to come up with interesting combinations and see how they would mix on the press. It was often hard to predict. And all this was done, all these fancy uh, color uh, effects you see here were done with, on the paste up with, with uh, overlays, even the duotones. Uh, after Metropolis folded, I worked on a small paper called Machete, which was uh, formed by a few of the same people who were at Metropolis. It was basically a large format broadside, uh, just two, one sheet, two pages, uh, you know, two sides. Uh, again, looking back on it, it had a lot in common with the paper I did in high school. The same non-existent budget, the same do-it-yourself, whatever works production methods, except now I had access to better ways of setting type and had a bit more training and experience. But this is kind of what I mean by offset being my native medium. I always loved the freeform aspect of it, the way you could print anything you wanted, as long as you could, fig as you could figure out a way to get it onto the paste up. Letterpress always seemed kind of rigid and straightjacketed by comparison, so I never really took to it. Of course, nowadays, you've got people making stuff on computers and printing with polymer plates on Vandercooks, completely sidestepping these limitations. Hmm. Anyway, whenever I think back on those pre-digital production methods and about how Letterpress has enjoyed such a glorious revival, I wonder if the same thing couldn't happen with old school offset printing techniques uh, and production techniques. I, I picture young people acquiring old AB Dick presses, orthographic film, uh, stripping materials like red blockout tape, you no, know, picking brushes and goldenrod stripping paper, or maybe some carbon arc lamps and a vacuum frame for making plates, or Maybe get an old type, photo typesetting machine like a Compigraphic Edit Writer or Very Typer Comp Set and a few fonts to match. It couldn't be that hard to get something like that up and running, right? I mean, people are still running vintage Apple IIs. I just saw a Commodore 64 out in the lobby. Why not old typesetting machines? Lots of other stuff isn't that hard to find, even in 2014. Rubber cement, X-Acto knives, T-squares. I've seen them done at Dick Blick. But can't you picture it, though? Young hipsters doing the whole thing 70s style, from paste-ups to freshly printed, printed pages, you know, running stack cameras and rubbing down type. I don't know. Maybe it's not really possible anymore. Where would they get the rolls of S paper or RC paper to use with the prototype setting machines and the chemicals? I doubt that stuff is even made anymore. Even if you could somehow find a cache of it uh, or uh, vintage, vintage supplies, they'd be decades past the use-by date. On the other hand, it might work with some, something like the old IBM Compositor or Berry Typer machine. These were the low-end strike-on typesetters. It worked a lot like typewriters, but they had proportional fonts. Uh, things like the Whole Earth Catalog and hundreds of small newspaper publishers and, and uh, printers used these back in the 70s as a cheap alternative to a full, you know, phototype setting machine. You didn't need any chemicals or photo paper for it, but you'd still need to source the rib ink ribbon cartridges somehow. Do they still exist? Maybe, I don't know. 
Now, rubdown sheets, rubdown type, still kind of exists. It's uh, used for scrapbooking and other hobby type things. The styles are a bit more limited than they used to be, uh, but there must be caches of vintage rubdown type in the hands of collectors and all pack rats. Uh, I know I've got a bunch of it. It's part of my collection here. Uh, you can easily revive it with a bit of alcohol, I'm told, or maybe that was with a a bit of alcohol, you can easily imagine that you could revive it. <laughs> or what about photostat cameras? For those of, you don't, who don't, those of you who don't know, these were large format cameras for reducing and enlarging line art. I imagine they must still exist somewhere, maybe in, for, in a forgotten storage locker somewhere in the back of somebody's garage. Uh, but like the photo typesetting machines, consumable, consumables might be a problem. And yet, in many ways, modern print production is a direct descendant of all these methods. Instead of stat cameras, we've got scanners. Instead of typesetting machines, we've got InDesign. Instead of Letraset, we've got digital fonts. And we never, ever run out of the letter E. So all of it goes, and all of this goes direct to plate, so you don't need stripping or arc lamps or any of that stuff. And offset still is the king of printing methods, even with the widespread adoption of digital printing. So what have we lost? In terms of reproduction quality, it's never been better. And going from an idea to a finished printed piece has never been easier or faster or cheaper. What I miss sometimes is the physical directness of it all. Sticking bits of paper and type down on a drawing board and drawing ink, ink lines with ink and laying down rule tapes. It was all kind of tedious and imperfect, but it was magical in a way. Uh, there's really no reason, though, that you couldn't use some of these old methods now, using scanners instead of stat cameras, for example. In fact, some people have been doing this sort of thing for a while, doing stuff on paper with traditional tools and media, and then using computers as little more than glorified copy machine or stat cameras. And this is going back, you know, to like the 90s with the grunge era, and you know, a lot of people I know who do comics, you just that's how they they just do everything the old school way, and then then. Uh, Put it, get it in the computer somehow. But the default path, the, you know, the easy path, is to create as much as possible directly on the computer, never taking your eyes off the screen as you type and point and click, creating artwork that's ultimately nothing more than a state of an array of flip-flops on a silicon chip, completely inaccessible and invisible without a, some sort of computer to read it. I certainly don't fault anyone for doing this. It's the way I work most of the time myself. It only makes sense. But it's good to remember that you don't have to use the computer for everything. It can be very satisfying to make something physical with your own hands, something you'll be able to hold in your hands and show people 40 years later, maybe at a type conference, people who have uh, embraced letterpress, old obsolete letterpress, know this to be true. And it's certainly not the most efficient means of reproducing something. But the lure of letterpress and other older technologies is at least about the journey as it is it, it, at least as much about the journey as it is about the destination. But we didn't go directly from letterpress to desktop publishing. There were pre-digital analog production methods we could still use today if we wanted to. I don't know. To be honest, I really don't expect anyone to revive this stuff. Although it would be pretty cool if it happened. Most of what I wanted to do is to take you on a little trip through my formative experiences as a young graphic designer back in the days after letterpress, but before computers took over everything in the graphic arts. So maybe get your nose out of the computer once in a while. Try making something with your hands. It's really fun. You never know where it might lead. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.